those of you just joining, if you can hear me, I'm hoping that you will un, I mean, what am I just trying to say? Get on screen. Thank you, Dr. Shelby Wartz, Southry Jeffrey, counselor. Thank you, Allison, my friend's house. Good to see you. We have some rocking tunes. You're gonna get to see this video later. Woohoo! Nice to see you all. Thanks for being here. So when you're ready, if you can go off video, I'm gonna encourage people to show up and see. Those of you just joining, if you could get on video so we can see you. Today is about showing up for each other, which means we need to be able to see you. If you have something going on in the background, don't sweat it. It's Zoom. We've probably seen it all. I mean, it's COVID. So um, please join us. Be visible. Support your other folks here. We have lots of people joining, so we're just waiting for some more people to come in before we dive in.
It's an honor to be able to address everyone who's watching this video, to tell you about My Friend's House and to thank you for your donations and your support. My Friend's House name is near and dear to our hearts. It used to be when we first opened, our, our name used to be just Collingwood Crisis Centre. It was uninspiring and really didn't describe what we did. Shortly after we opened, we had a boy staying with, at my friend's house with his mother. We were, he was told to go back to school, be with his friends, to have a nice break from the disruption in his life. And when he went to school, he told his friends that he had moved. And when the kids asked him where he had moved, he had said, my friend's house. And in that moment, we realized who we were and why we exist. That is to be a friend to abused women and their children in this community. I can't thank our community enough for providing the support we need to keep our doors open 24 seven. Without you, there's no way, there is no way our doors would be open. You are the ones that keep moving us forward. I so appreciate you. Thanks for being a friend. Hi, good afternoon and welcome everyone to this exciting event. This is our fourth annual International Women's Day event in Collingwood. And it was wonderful to see many of you at our flag raising last week. And I would like to start off today by reading our local land acknowledgement. For more than 15,000 years, the First Nations walked upon and cared for the lands we now call home. Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, and Ojibwe, and many others who were families, friends, and communities the way we are today. The town of Collingwood acknowledges the Lake Simcoe Nottawasaga Treaty of 1818 and the relationship it establishes with the original inhabitants of Turtle Island. We acknowledge the reality of our shared history and the current contributions of Indigenous people within our community. We seek to continue empowering expressions of pride amongst all of the diverse stakeholders in this area. We seek to do better and to continue to recognize, learn and grow in friendship and community nation to nation. It's now my privilege to introduce Jill Proud, who is our moderator for today. Uh, she is a dynamic facilitator an experienced manager and a coach, coach to senior leaders across Canada. To Jill's credit, she has coached and mentored high achieving leaders from seasoned entrepreneurs to Olympic athletes for over 20 years and launched the Women's President's Organization, South Georgian Bay Chapter. Jill's passion lies in helping people to see a bigger future for themselves, and her expertise lies in giving them the skills and motivation to make it a reality. In addition to operating as a teacher in one too many environments, Jill oversees a thriving executive coaching practice where she coaches individuals at all levels and stages of their career, from frontline managers to a roster of C-level clients yet still finds time to be actively involved in not-for-profit work, acting as the vice, president, uh, vice chair of Women in Philanthropy for Providence Advisory Group in celebration of International Women's Day. Following good welcomes, Jill Proud. We have a very exciting panel today, and I'm very much looking forward to this event. And this year's theme is hashtag break the bias. Jill. Thank you, Mayor Saunderson. I appreciate that intro and um, they always feel too long when it's you being intro, don't you find that? Um, so thank you for that. I'm excited to be here. Last year, I was able to be the moderator the year before. I was, I was on, the, on the stage, we got to gather. So um, thank you to all of you for showing up today. Um, that's what this today is all about. So here's what we're gonna do. We are gonna make sure that we ground us all in why we're here today, for the next couple of hours to make really uh, good use of the value of your time and energy. And because we all wanna be responsible for breaking the bias this year and uh, keeping women rising. And so we're gonna do a couple of things. We're gonna do an opener that helps ground us in what is bias and why does it matter? A short one, and then we're gonna dive into our amazing panelists and hearing their stories and having some connection time with them. And then we have a really healthy time for Q&A. Last year, we got feedback saying we want more of that. So we've been able to do that this year. So kudos to the committee. And then we'll wrap with, and I want you to be thinking about this, um, what 
is a way that I specifically in the year ahead, 2022, can break the bias. It may be that you're doing something. It may be that you're not sure what you can do. You may think your contribution isn't big enough. It may be that you are confused about you know, what your part could be. And all of that's okay, because we have some amazing speakers today that are gonna help bring some illumination and connection here. So um, one of the things in my work is I have a sort of, my whole company is about being a vital visionary. And it really came primarily from the work that I did with women leaders in my world. And a vital visionary is somebody who uh, seeks to have impact in all areas of their world by being a model for, or a force for positive change and a model for leading with purpose and compassion in order to build the emerging system of power that is happening, which is creative, collaborative, inclusive. And so I feel super excited to be here today because I think all of the stuff that we're gonna be doing today completely aligns with the vital visionary mission that I'm on because I noticed so many women leaders burning themselves out, facing bias, exhausted, um, all of the things um, and not really staying vital, even though they had a great vision for what was possible for them. And sometimes your vision is being compromised because they actually were feeling bias or not enough and all of those things. And so um, I felt like there was a need to name it. The so Vital Visionary is all about being able to show up in vitality and realize your vision for yourself, your community, and even the bigger world, wherever you want to impact. I wanted to start today with um, the call to action with International Women's Day is all around elevating women to equity. And I'm gonna show you a, slow later, uh, a slide later, but really part of what we need to get our language around is equity versus equality. So I'm gonna show you a slide later that hopefully will help with that. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. And bias, break the bias is all about, bias can be conscious or unconscious. And some of the biases you have are actually awesome and you wanna keep them. We have positive biases. We have biases that help us see people in a deeply compassionate way. So keep that one, right? We have biases that let us see our kids, even though they're going through a struggle, in a way that we know they're gonna make it through. Our bias is to believe in them, right? So there are biases that work for us. The thing we're here to challenge today and break is the biases that no longer work. And so our world is shifting and I wanna acknowledge the following. We have had a wildly wild ride the last two years. We have world events happening right now. So the people I'm talking to are anywhere from exhausted, sad, you know, deeply concerned, to also inspired by seeing what's happening out there in the world as we've come together to support each other. And there's been a lot of this happening and a lot of this happening. So both is true. We've had this diver divergence and convergence happening. So I wanna to acknowledge today that you've got a couple of hours to really be present here. So I invite you to be on video, participate fully, be here with us. And I'm gonna give you some prompts of things you can be doing. The first thing I wanna do though is a practice session. And the practice session is super simple. It'll be likely the hardest part of this session in many ways. And it's gonna be a group photo, not now, later. And I want us to all practice being able to do the symbol, which I just put up, which is break the bias for this year. And the key thing is this, when we're taking the photo later, not now, but we're gonna practice now, is that we're not doing this because we actually wanna see your face, right? We're not down here, so we can't see you. You gotta kind of nail it in your camera. And we need enough of you on screen doing it that we can actually see everybody and it fills the screen. So I'm gonna ask you to please, right now, raise your, I'm gonna put you on gallery so I can see you all. Raise your hands in the break the bias. Make sure you can see your face. Can you see yourself? Okay, awesome. That's it. Not now, but later we're gonna take a picture. Well done. See, you're doing great. All right, so um, as far as today goes, here's a few ways that you can participate. We wanna make this as engaging as possible. And that means that um, we actually really are showing up for each other. So visible on audio, ideally. We are recording and the recording will happen up until the Q&A. And then the Q&A will turn it off because we're gonna have some deep, rich discussions there that may be safer place to not necessarily have a recording. And then we will reinitiate the recording once we dive into the last part of uh, today's event. The chat, please open it down on the bottom part of your Zoom. You will see the little box that says chat, the little bubble, please open it. And I would love for you just to type in right now, literally think for 15 or 20 seconds about the following question. Why are you here today? Why did you choose to show up? What is something you, uh, what's important about being here? Is it to be in community? Is it to learn something? 
Is it to figure out how you can break the bias um, to see a particular speaker? But why for you? And I'd like you to please type in the chat so we can start to see why are people here? To be inspired. Thank you, Linda. Connection with other local women in our community. Thank you, Lori Blair. To listen, Krista. Yeah, we need to do more of that in the world. To be connected, Christiane. Thank you. To see I'm not alone, Alison Fitzgerald. Thank you. Beautifully said. To learn and to be inspired. Awesome. Fran, I came here today because I want to feel the energy of an amazing group of women. I wanted to hear the inspiring stories of the speakers. Awesome. So you can start to see that not only are there different things we're here for, but also lots of common themes. So um, our job today is to do our best to hold a space that helps to do all of this. And your job today is to hold the space for each other to actually participate to ensure that there's energy and inspiration because it's not just up to our speakers and me and others who are here, it's up to all of you. So please keep engaging in the chat. Thank you all, you did a brilliant job. And we'll be asking you some questions throughout so we can start to keep seeing what's coming up here. Excellent, you're still going, that's great. So um, as far as icons go, uh, sometimes your speakers don't know who's out there. I'll be on screen with them, but it's kind of nice when somebody goes, hey, we're gonna give you a little love icon or we're gonna give you a clap or something. Um, when you go down to your reactions, there's a little smiley guy that says reactions. You can react there, right? There's all kinds of icons there. There's also a raise your hand. And when we get to question and answer, we'll just prompt you because we may have some people that actually want to rather than put their question in the chat, actually speak, speak it. Um, so I promise you today, there will be some inspiration, you will be more knowledgeable. And what our whole goal is today is to activate you to specifically make a shift, something that's gonna help break the bias this year. And so be thinking about that as you're hearing the speakers and as you, we move through the day. Um, I was gonna read something from International Women's Day just to ground us in what this today is all about. And then Rosemary O'Brien, who is on the committee, who has helped spearhead all of this, day to day and make sure we're on script for our run of show and everything's tickety boo, sent this really beautiful email. And so I'm gonna go off script and go to the email. And she sent it to a whole bunch of us who are part of today. Happy International Women's Day to all the resilient, compassionate champions who show their strength, courage and incredible spirit each and every day at work, at home, at play, or just reaching out to help someone else find the light inside them to carry on. Today is our day. You are considered, you are loved, you are worthy, you are deserving, you are respected, you are inspiring, you are powerful, you are important, you are vital, you are all of those things and so much more. Remember that always. Thank you, Rosemary. That was beautiful to receive just before we started this event. So we share that with you, breathe that in, and let's dive in. Here's the thing yeah. about bias. We're gonna put up a definition so Hello. we're all clear and oh yes rosemary sorry just before you go on i wondered if you noticed in the chat hadil has joined us from the middle east oh hadil welcome that's fantastic yay it's been a year it's great to see you i hope you can see us thank you that's great so we're going to start with definition of bias real quick and if you can put that up on the screen in the chat wherever the magic's going to happen and we'll make sure we're all grounded in what is bias? If we're gonna break it, what is it? Excellent. So an inclination or preference formed without reasonable justification that can prevent judgment from being balanced or even handed. It may be unconscious or it may be conscious and can occur at an individual group or institutional level. So, here's what our sort of definition is today that we're working with. And it can sound a little heady. What I'm gonna to say to you is bias is like a lens we see through the world. Our lens isn't the truth. Our lens is our truth. It isn't a universal truth, right? Gravity is a universal truth. If I drop the pen, it's gonna fall. And even there, there's exceptions. If we were in a vacuum, that wouldn't happen. And so really biases are beliefs, experiences, the way we see the world. And because we can't see the lens through which we see the world, it's tricky. It's tricky because we're just being us. We're just thinking in the ways we've always thought. We're building on the experience we've already had. We're calling on the people around us who are maybe like us. And so bias is a tricky one. Plus, we don't really want to see ourselves necessarily in the light of being biased. It can sound negative. And I want to reiterate, you've got awesome positive biases. The challenge is when we can't really see it. 
and we don't even mean to necessarily either be hurtful or cause cause harm and we do and so personally i'm making a commitment to you i want to know that it's not always easy but i want to know it so here's a couple of things to think about good intentions aren't enough we know the things we're you know supposed to pay attention to or not do it's the actions we need to take. And sometimes we don't even know. So when biases are unconscious, we need to make them conscious. So three things to pay attention to today. One, acknowledge it in yourself. Where's one place that you notice potentially you have a bias that you wanna work on in some way? Number two, um, commit to personal change. So personal change comes from not just knowing, but actually doing. And I'm gonna to say to you, the biggest thing I see in my leadership practices and, and when I work across the world, is when we're not specific enough, it's really hard to get there. It's really hard to actually commit because we're not being clear. So making a commitment that says, I'm gonna call out bias is really not very helpful. Where are you gonna call it out? When, who, where are you gonna, what, what lens are you gonna look at bias through? It could be gender, it could be racial, it could be all kinds of things. So the more specific you are, the more successful you will be. And the third thing is find your people, find groups like this who can actually support having what this is supposed to be today, really, which we're like, our aim is to have this safe space to have a really great conversation. And we don't all know it. So I don't know it all. And so I really need as much support as any of you to figure some of this stuff out. And we're hoping this is a play, place to sort of play in practice and find our people who can help us get better. So as far as um, a couple of slides to ground us in the world today, I just wanna give you two things. The first slide is around um, Maslow's hierarchy. And most of you have seen this in some or many forms. So I'm just gonna wait till that comes up. Excellent. And right now I am seeing Mayor Saunderson, not me or the slide, excellent, thank you. So here's a reminder, in the world, if you look at this, what happened just as COVID started to hit and has happened for the last two years is a whole bunch of people, particularly in developed worlds, we're sitting around love and belonging, esteem, coming to self-actualize some version of living a life of maybe meaning and purpose. We were playing a little higher on the pyramid. As soon as the COVID hit, you could watch the whole world drop into some version of safety and physiological needs. Will distribution channels be interrupted? Will we actually be able to get toilet paper, like you know, medicine, like all of the things, real and funny? And safety, are we safe in the world? And so why we've been so exhausted is because we've been playing a lot there. And if we haven't been playing and we've been coming up, a lot of people around us are still there. So I just wanted to give some context to, if you're feeling it in the world today, you're supposed to, it's real. And here's the thing, how it relates to bias is when we're at physiological needs on Maslow's hierarchy and safety, when we're playing at that more sort of level of that level, it means we will be more triggered more easily we won't be willing to see the things in us that are challenging or the things in the world are challenging because we're tired, exhausted and all the things. And so if we're gonna play with bias today, one thing I would say is take a deep breath, right? Get present to here and these amazing stories you're gonna hear and really start to play with where is your place of whether you call it love and belonging, community, um, how can you be playing at that level and helping both others to rise and also to build a lot of strength around there so we can move into that space. Because when we're in that space, we are much more likely to both see our biases and be able to break the bias. Does that make sense to people? Put it in the chat for me. Does it make sense the bigger part of the world and what's happening in the energy and that if we go, if we challenge ourselves to rise up farther, that we're gonna be better at actually getting to equity and breaking biases? So in the chat, does that hit for people? Does it resonate? Does it feel like it's true for you? Can you see it happening in the world? Yeses, makes sense, perfect sense. Great. So one of the things I want you to also look at is where are you sitting? Because one of the things around biases is we need to open ourselves up. And if we're sitting in that place of feeling like we need to protect, that's not the most open place to be, right? So just to challenge yourself to think about how can I stretch? Thanks for the feedback. So the second part I would just wanna to give to you is this, um, some language stuff. One of the pieces of language is equity versus equality. And so I wanna just throw up that slide. I love this slide for many reasons. There is a version that now has people of color in it and it was adapted from this original version. This is the version that I have copyright to. So I didn't wanna use the other one um, for that reason because I don't have copyright. It also has an explanation. 
here's the visual and I'm hoping you can see it. And if you wanna pop it up and take me off the screen, um, that's totally good, Tyler, because I want people to be able to see the box as well. You'll notice in the left-hand side where it says equality, everybody gets the same box. So no matter what your background, how tall you are, what your race is, any of your background, it doesn't matter, you get the same box. And that's what equality can look like. Equity instead says, hey, you're already really tall. You don't actually even need a box. The next person only needs one box and the little guy there needs two boxes. That's what equity is. And I think one of the biases is when we see it just through equality and don't move to equity, some of the challenges are that we think by giving everybody the same thing, that that has solved the problem. And it's actually just not true. So I want you to keep that image in your head when you think about how do we get to equity and because that's a big part of breaking the bias. So I hope those frames were important for you in terms of just giving some language. Oh, and the last thing in language I just wanted to say was um, the word intersectionality is a big word and sometimes we don't always know what it means. And I just wanna share with you that if there's something that comes up you don't know, throw it in the chat, we'll answer questions and we'll make sure we get to it. Um, intersectionality is any coming together of two or more different kinds of things, people, et cetera. So you could have a woman who is also uh, LGBTQ, who may also be um, black indigenous or a person of color. You could have somebody who's a woman who's coming from poverty and or coming from privilege. That's a bias, could be an immigrant. And so that's what intersectionality is. It's the coming together of multiple ways of being and looking at the world. So when we use that word, that's what we're talking about. All right, we're going to dive in. And before we do, we are going to do our first photograph. So if everybody could please get ready to strike your pose, our awesome tech person, Tyler Cleary, who is doing the magic behind the scenes, is going to put up this amazing slide where we can actually see a camera. And there's going to be a little click thing that happens. So I'm going to ask us to do this. And then the click thing is going to happen. We have to wait till the end of the click thing to stop doing this. Got it? Do this till the end of the click thing. Are we good? Thumbs up. All right. Everybody up, ready to go? All right. And we can have smiles because breaking the bias is also about supporting each other. Are we good, Tyler? It sounds like it. Excellent. Excellent. I love it. The voice of Tyler. Okay. So um, we're going to dive into our speakers. And here's what I wanted to, um, what we're going to start with. Marcy Alderson is going to be our first speaker. And she has this beautiful video of her brand new song that we're going to start with. And so before I introduce her, I thought we'd just go to the video and watch the video first. And then I can do the intro and Marcy and I can dive into her story share.
she'd had enough Don't shut politely in her face Don't shut because of race But not be defined By the closed minds Justice was hers to find Judge by the color of her skin Young woman takes a stand Yay! Yeah, you can put your clappy emoticon on. That's fun. Uh, so, Marcia, uh, I love that for so many reasons. I think that beautiful, strong chant, I can't get out of my head because I'm hearing it everywhere. Um, and it's powerful. So, Marcia, um, for those of you who don't know, but I think most people, if anybody's around here knows, is a singer, real estate agent, advocate for change. She is um, like for video powerful, strong, and also, in my experience, um, amazingly giving and big, huge heart and would have, uh, give you the shirt off her back, but she'd find a better way to do that, to raise money and just uh, got an award for raising money for shelters through Royal LePage. Like, it means there's so many things to say. And you are part of the Unity Collective here in Colombo. So yeah. you can all see everybody's bios on the website. You can research them. There's lots of information. Um, we really want to get to the actual story and conversation with you. So uh, let's dive in. And I'm here. I'd love to hear where you want to start, and then we'll take it from there. Well, I think the beginning is always a pretty good place to start. Jill, thank you for having me on this. It's, uh, it's quite an honor to be amongst this panel. It's actually freaked me out just a little bit. <laughs> it's like, wow. <laughs> So basically, you know, I love Collingwood. I just think it's the most incredible place. And we're very, very lucky to be here. And this town um, is certainly embracing change. So we're, we're very fortunate with that. The song you just heard is my mother's story. And it all started back really in 2020 when we were in the throes of COVID and scared and glued to the TV cameras, or to the TV, uh, to the TV itself. And George Floyd was on there 24 seven and nobody could escape. And finally people got it. He won't be the first, he won't be the last, but people got it. And I was quite upset one day and my teenage son, we were sitting at, at the kitchen counter and I suddenly remembered a story that I hadn't thought about for decades. And I said to him, with all of this going on and racism, and I said to him, did I ever tell you the story of how, you know, your, your grandparents met? And I hadn't heard it because I hadn't thought about it for decades. And I went on and I told him the story. And then I wound up at the first Black Lives Matter march, not really thinking there would be that many people, but there were 2,000 people. And somebody handed me uh, a bullhorn. Well. That's kind of it for me. You give me a microphone or a bullhorn and I'm happy as can be. And I started telling the story. And the way it sort of goes is my mother came to this country in the early 50s as a young black Jamaican nurse. She just felt Jamaica was just too small. She wanted a place to grow and stretch her wings. And up she came herself when she was 19 or 20 as a nurse. And she had a few you know, things that happened in, in the beginning. It, it maybe not wasn't as overt, 
But she, for example, told me the story that she would go to rent an apartment. She would call. Yes, it's available. Certainly come right over. And she would show up 10 or 15 minutes later and they would open the door and take a look and say, oh, I'm so sorry. It's just been rented and politely close the door. That happens to you a few times you start to get that it's not probably rented. The big thing came in the early 60s when she went to buy her first house. So now this is a young single woman going to buy her first house in the early 60s in Scarborough, all by herself. And she went into the new home sales office and she said she met the nicest and whitest salesman in Canada. And she put in her offer and he was quite pleased with it. Full price, she's well qualified, all good. He goes and takes the offer to the builder. Now the salesman was named George Hubbs. Interesting, I see we have a Lynn Hubbs on the, uh, in, in the audience. So we might be related, we're not sure. <laughs> anyway, he takes the offer to the builder. In the process of the presentation, and this is where I, I, I find it kind of interesting. In the process of the presentation, this is a young single woman. He feels the need to justify, and I'm wondering if there wasn't two biases going on here, because he feels the need to justify to the builder that I know she's a young single woman, but she is well qualified. And in this process, he says to the builder, no, she is, a, she is well qualified. She is a young Jamaican nurse. Great job. And the builder stopped him right in his tracks and said, I'm not selling to those people. He wasn't talking about women. So the interesting part of this story is um, the salesperson, George Hubbs, goes back and tells my mother exactly what the builder had said, tells her the truth, not the story the builder had told him to tell her. My mother decides to fight because at this point she's had enough and she decides to fight. So she decides to take that builder who would not sell her the house because of the color of her skin to the Human Rights Commission of Canada. Now, interesting enough, the nicest and whitest salesperson in Canada, George Hubbs, decides to testify for her at risk of his own job. As it turned out, my mother won. She got her house. She moved in. George Hubbs got fired by the builder. Fair enough. Didn't think they could work together anymore. So he stood up. He did the right thing. He lost his job, but ironically, he gained a family because they started dating a few months later. They got married and they made me. And now it's my turn to fight for what's right and what's just. And thank you for giving me a platform on International Women's Day. Pretty exciting. I don't hear you, Jill. <laughs> we love an exceptional story. And um, the, the song, I love the, the imagery that you had. One of the lines is, um, freedom has its conditions in the land of normal lights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, you know, it's one of those lines. Craig Smith and I wrote this together. Um, he wrote all the music and he helped me sculpt the words. And it was very interesting how this song came about. I've never written anything. Barely wrote a poem in school unless I was forced to. But when we decided that we needed to do, we wanted to do original music, Craig told me to write about what I knew. And so I knew that, that one of the driving forces had been this change in this town and, and all the you know good that was happening in the Black Lives Matter marches. And I woke up one night at 10 to two, I won't forget it, and I had in my head the line, privilege and palm trees and land of ice and snow. So my mother came from a, a, a privileged family in Jamaica. She, racism never touched her. Her father was a dentist, she was good. I got up and I wrote those few lines down and then words just kept coming. And within a, about 40 minutes, I had an entire page of lyrics. We didn't use them all, but we used most of them. And we sculpted this song and, and that actually imagery, that was a Craig line. I have to give him credit for that. And it, you know, it just, it, it, it paints a picture. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to paint a picture to maybe make people think and show people what biases do look like in a way. So I guess that's why I'm here. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Well, absolutely. And, um, and I think that the significance of that, what feels to me a very kind of tribal beat of, of the beat, like the whole, it just feels like I want to move. I feel like it could be a call to action for, you know, we get out and march someday. Um, oh, maybe the next Black Lives Matter. 
Uh, so what about for you in terms of, you know, you, you, your mother inspired this amazing song and story, I'm sure it brought. I lost you, Jill. I don't know what happened to your sound. You muted It's you. okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to jump in for a moment. We're having a bit of a choppy issue with Jill's microphone. So our tech wizard, Tyler, is working on that. Um, so you know what, Marcia, from one singer to another, uh -huh. um, you did an amazing job on that song. Thank you me. reflected your mother's situation so beautifully, and you had the rhythm. So it's so inspiring to listen because words matter. They, they matter, and they, they can be part of that break the bias uh, phenomenon, you know? People take for granted that, you know, you say something to someone and it's offhanded, but you don't know their story. So it can be hurtful. It can be thought provoking. It can be whatever it means to them. But you so eloquently shared your mom's story and made it your own. And you can literally feel your strength when you're singing that song. It's wonderful. Thank my you. my compliments to you because it it brings uh, it brings I'm sure a tear to some eyes, but it also brings some happiness to others. And I think it's phenomenal what you've been able to do with it. So kudos to you, my friend. You're a, you're a strong woman, and you have an abundant of talent. So I, I'm so enjoying listening to you. So uh, Jill, are we good with you now? Can you uh, take that? Can you hear me okay? Not bad. Oh, there you go. We're better. Well, Rosemary, but you know what? Those tiny glitches still give me an opportunity to jump in and say hi and yay. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll turn it back over to Jill. Thanks, Rosemary. Okay. And if we have anything like that, just somebody wave, flag me, yell at me. That's fine. We can just go with it. You guys are awesome. That's what happens these days. Um, mm -hmm. So on that, Marcy, I just wanted you to um, reflect on just as we, and maybe we can tell this, because you told me a story of when you were young. We were talking about racial bias. We were talking about gender bias. And you told me this great story. So maybe we'll save your soccer story for when we get to the Q&A. And we can hear a little bit more about how you, um, you know, really recognize being a young girl was different than being a young boy. Mm -hmm. Can we save that? <laughs> Good. As we wrap your session, before we move on, I just wanted to ask you and ask everybody to be thinking about, as you think about the year ahead and breaking the bias and what it means to you, mm -hmm. um, what's something that you're feeling called to focus on this year? And um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, I mean, I think since I've been focusing on, and I think it's not just this year, it's certainly since since 2020, and um, the Black Lives Matter marches started a lot of things in this town. Um, between the Confederate flags, the Black Lives Matter marches, it led to the Unity Collective, it led to all of that. So sort of the, the, the theme that I've been saying is, we change this narrative and we change bias and racism one uncomfortable conversation at a time. And I've had my share. Yeah. I've had yeah. my share. I've gained friends through it. I've lost a few, but myself, I can look in the mirror and know that when something is said that is either off color, it's not right. It makes somebody else feel uncomfortable. I may not always have stood up, but I do now. And that's not going to change. And International Women's Day is a heck of a good day to start doing that. So one uncomfortable conversation at a time and let everybody know that they have, they belong, yeah. that, and that they have a seat at the table. Awesome. Women, everybody. I love it. So for you, one uncomfortable conversation, even if it means, and there's risk involved, right. some people will stay, some people will go. Absolutely. Awesome. That's all about boundaries and taking the higher road. Um, fantastic. Okay. You're giving people ideas as they think about what they're going to do. Thank you for that. We're going to come back to you with the Q&A, so stay tuned. And we'll see you there. Thank you. All right. So we are going to move on to our next speaker who is going to share uh, her story with you from a, another perspective. We have lots of perspectives today. I'm super excited. Um, Makpalu Apili is, has done, 
I had a chance to meet Makalu just yesterday and um, was super inspired by your her whole journey around really learning to embrace both personally and in her now professional world, learning to embrace her Inuit culture and what that meant for her. And so I'm really looking forward to her share. Um, something that I was really inspired by was um, taking that personal journey and turning it into a whole organization that she is now CEO of called the Urban Inuit Identity Project. It, I'm looking so forward to look, all of you learning more about it. Um, and uh, Makpalu comes from, in terms of her educational background, is a medical laboratory technologist. And so has this specialty around understanding healthcare and compassionate care and that intersection of compassionate care in our sort of Western white medicine. And how do you include the um, indigenous and Inuit perspective into that? So it's more inclusive. So uh, I'm gonna invite Makpalu onto stage, please. Hello. Hi. Hi, Jill. Thank you um, for hosting this event. And um, I'm so happy uh, to see my supporters. Some supporters came from the Collingwood Indigenous Circle Facebook page. I did see you. Um, so thank you for joining. Um, so, so I just wanted to share about um, why I started the Urban Inuit Identity Project. And um, what I like to do is share personal stories about how um, I've ended up in this place. So when I was younger, um, I was living in Ottawa um, and um, amongst other Inuit. And first of all, I was born in Iqaluit, Nunavut. Um, and my mom decided to bring uh, myself when I was three months old and my older sister, um, Timuti, who was 14 years old at the time, um, she decided that she wanted to raise us in Ottawa. There's several reasons why Inuit leave Inuit traditional lands. Um, one of them being uh, my mom experienced the residential schools as a child. And so there was a lot of intergenerational trauma. Um, and for her, she felt that moving to Ottawa, she would have company of other fellow Inuit. And that's where most Inuit are outside of our traditional lands. At the time, there was only a hundred Inuit, but for her, that meant uh, being able to speak her language and being amongst other Inuit. Um, as we grow, grew up in Ottawa, um, I was able to keep my Inuit culture. I was able to learn the language and um, be with other fellow Inuit. Um, my mom met um, her, her partner in Ottawa and all in all, we ended up being four girls. And uh, when I was 12, unfortunately, she left the family. And um, as a residential school survivor, um, that meant that she had a lot of trauma in her past as well. And um, Canada was very much involved in that. So what I'm talking about is Canadian policies trying to assimilate Inuit, who used to be a nomadic people, and forcing them to stay on settlements. Um, and so... Uh, part of the agreement for Inuit moving onto the settlements was that um, it was also forced and that um, children had to go to residential schools. Um, in the 1940s and 50s, Inuit were experiencing a famine, so they were starving and the uh, Canadian government wanted to help. And so they decided that it would be best for Inuit to settle. And um, so some of the reasons why Inuit are in the disparity that they are in is because of the way that they tried to um, settle us. Um, so when I was when I was 12, my mom, she left the family. Um, she, of course, experienced abuse uh, that I didn't understand at the time. Uh, this created a huge wound for me and the rest of my sisters, the youngest being four years old at the time. And um, moving forward, I had a lot of resentment and anger towards that. Um, I tried to understand it, um, but there are certain expectations you have on people, like your mother is the one that's supposed to be there always. She should never turn her back on you, but that's what happened. Um, when I, uh, when, we, when I turned 14, my dad decided that he needed to take care of us four girls. And um, to do that, he would move back to his hometown, which was Welland, Ontario. It was there that I experienced my, my first um, racist remarks. Um, this came from the neighbor across the street. This also came at the workplace where I worked at, 
which was retirement home and the older population had their um, judgments against me. So this is uh, early 2000s. Um, throughout my journey, I tried to regain my Inuit connection. Being in Welland, Ontario, there wasn't that opportunity there. Although I did search for an Inuit culture and connection through Indigenous Friendship Centers. And along my path, I tried to learn about residential schools and in time I forgave my mom. It would have been helpful if there were people involved in the circle of care for us for girls to help us through that, but there wasn't at the time. Um, a lot of people didn't know that uh, Inuit in Canada have our own history with Canada and the creation of residential schools were actually called federal day schools or hostels. Um, and so moving forward, um, uh, I tried to um, become healthy enough in order to enter school. And I was able to do that with the help of a uh, young man named Michael Talbot. And we're together ever since. I uh, moved um, from Welland, Ontario to Collingwood. And uh, we moved to Collingwood because my dad was looking for employment. He decided this would be a wonderful town to raise the girls in. And so we moved uh, us, he moved us to Collingwood, and that's how I got here. But um, through that time, I met this young man, Michael Talbot. He helped me unpackage, unpack a lot of my baggage from the intergenerational trauma that I experienced. Um, intergenerational trauma has its way of um, sort of infesting a family through alcoholism. And uh, so I was raised with that. And um, I met him and his family who came from a Christian background and their way of coping with uh, anger and disputes was nothing like the way that my family decided to deal with that. And I would always, you know, kind of wonder during this dispute, when do we start throwing dishes at each other? Cause it's just not happening. <laughs> this is the difference. This was my first experience with seeing what healthy coping looked like. Um, and so he was able to help me unpackage that. And, um, it takes time and investment to say, hey, this is this is normalized maybe in, in, in the experiences that you have, but it's not normal here. And through becoming aware about these and seeing what a healthy family dynamic looked like, um, I was able to also teach them about Inuit, what it meant, um, how what we believe in, um, the differences. And I also showed them different perspective about um, life isn't about money and things like that. So I was able to communicate with them in a way that they were able to um, appreciate. We were very respectful in these conversations um, and they became more aware about indigenous disparities and I became more aware about their culture. And um, I was finally healthy enough to enter uh, the education, in education to become a medical laboratory technologist when I was at the age of 28. Um, and I chose to go to Cambrian College because there was an, a large Indigenous support there. And um, uh, being an Indigenous person, we walk around with a different lens and a different view of things. Um, so other Indigenous groups also have this. We place value on being outside and in the nature and we place value not on money. Um, and so uh, I, through that, through the Cambrian College, I was supported. However, during my time there, I was becoming a healthcare worker, and I thought at some point we would talk about residential schools, um, 60 Scoop, and the reasons why some Indigenous communities are in the way that they are, and why, some, why, why so many Indigenous people are involved in the homeless community. And unfortunately, throughout all four years of school to become a healthcare professional, we didn't have that discussion. And I thought as Canadians, we all need to know and understand our Canadian history to help Indigenous. And um, so that's why this has started. And I also tried to find an Indigenous support along the way and they were just, people weren't well versed enough in Inuit culture. And it's important to know that there's 65,000 Inuit in Canada. And approximately 40% of us are outside of our Inuit traditional lands. And if we don't teach about Inuit culture, the loss of Inuit identity will continue. It's also perpetuated by organizations who are meant to help Indigenous people. Um, they should be well versed in Inuit culture in order to empower us. And this is just my piece of advocacy moving forward. There are uh, some 
Inuit specific resources um, like in Ottawa, Toronto, and Winnipeg, but for all the other cities, um, it's just important not to forget about Inuit. Um, and it's important for, for can Canadians moving forward to truth and reconciliation to understand about all three Indigenous um, distinctions, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. So in moving forward in our discussions with truth and reconciliation, I'm also asking that you include Inuit and Métis people moving forward. So I will leave it to Jill. I said a lot. <laughs> that was great. Thank you so much. Um, in hearing about your background, and, and we'll hear more in Q&A, so we won't spend too much time here because that was an awesome representation of where you're at and what you stand for and what your mission is. Um, the What's one of the things when you talked about the um, circle of care, what's one thing that uh, to give us a sense of what that really means, if you're, if we're being, if we're not being biased and we are being inclusive, what would that include? Uh, so that would include understanding what uh, moving forward. For me personally, I would think the best way moving forward with that question is to learn about reserves and the land claims. First of all, why do we have reserves? There's a lot of um, black and white questions that come out there being some, some questions along my path that I've received are, why don't they just move off the reserves if that is so, if they're so in despair? Well, first of all, you need to know the history of the reserves, how it got started, why, why do indigenous people really wanna hold on to that, uh, including the Indian Act. Also moving forward about learning about the Inuit land claim regions, Inuit Nunagat, uh, why do we have those? How did that start? Um, and it started because our Inuit elders um, acknowledged that the Southern Canadians had technology that would benefit Inuit moving forward. But infrastructure was being placed on Inuit lands without the consultation of Inuit. And so our Inuit elders bargained for that to, for us to say, you need to consult us first. And then also, if you want to use our land, we will help you do that, but you also need to give us some benefits for that. So this was a negotiation between Inuit, federal government, Her Majesty the Queen. So we ended up with different things. So First Nations in the South ended up with the status card and Inuit in the North ended up with the end number. And so as healthcare professionals and people involved in helping Inuit, they need to know about these differences because so many times have I been asked for my status card and it isn't up to the patient to be able to educate the healthcare worker. And so that's how I think um, moving forward to learn about reserves and land claims. I'm always up for a conversation on that. Okay, good. You can be our, one of our resources. Um, and I think also to acknowledge that I love that you're up for that and also what's our responsibility because it can be exhausting in also informing ourselves and coming with informed questions and having done some maybe background research and you know having reflected a little on our own um, before coming forward, because that's part of respecting that um, if you're the sole source or you're the primary source, that can be a lot. Um, but I love the call out. So thank you that you are available for that. And thanks for explaining the community of care. And what I heard you say was fundamentally understanding um, why the system is structured the way it is and why it's really so toxic and not working. And then how can we move going forward? So, and I love the, that you're working in the healthcare sector, which um, uh, really is a place where the intersection of, um, in some cases, you know, whether it's, like you said, addiction, whether it's alcoholism, homelessness, all of those things come together and people do end up in healthcare systems. And so we need it there. Um, so thank you for that. Um, we're going to have you join us when we come back to the Q&A. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so you can see we're coming at bias from all kinds of places. And so I hope this is really bringing some, I know it's making me think and I'm looking forward to what your questions are. So please be thinking about what some of your questions are for our first two speakers and hold off on putting them in the chat yet, but we will get there. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge that there are charities that uh, each of us are sort of um, promoting and uh, sponsoring and uh, giving to. So Marcy and I have my friend's house as ours. There's Marcy as Mass. Um, and then uh, Dr. Marissa, I will, I will uh, mention yours in a moment. And then you'll see in the chat there for Mukpalu. Um, she has a couple of charities of choice and you can click on those, grab them, 
Um, they will also go in the newsletter that comes out afterwards or an email, sorry, that comes out after this event. So you'll have links there that you can support if you're, where you're so inspired. We are going to move on to our final speaker for today, who is uh, Dr. Marissa Rodway Norman. Uh, we're going to be calling her Dr. Marissa today. And um, there's so much to say. Uh, Dr. Marissa is a senior psychologist with more than 30 years of clinical experience. Um, she has assisted in all kinds of uh, research resulting in the establishment of the North Simcoe Trans Healthcare Hub of Aurelia, uh, which is amazing that I think we have that resource outside of Toronto. Um, she's also spearheaded ed educational opportunities on trans medicine and has served as a research consultant to the Gilbert Center of Barry. There's so many things um, in terms of research. One of the things in meeting Dr. Marissa yesterday was, I think you'll really appreciate, is um, I think, Dr. Marissa, how you speak with such grace and also um, so articulate. So I'm looking forward to you sharing your story and um, hearing what you're going to share today. Oh, you just need to go off mute. We cannot hear you. Just click your little mic there on the bottom left of the screen. And am I transmitting here? Got you. Okay, splendid. Just uh, thank you so much, Jill. I, I really appreciate that. And, and I too would echo the notion that I'm, I'm absolutely struck by, by uh, the earlier video performance, which... Uh, argues uh, for immense courage and tenacity and in the midst of, of seeing so many proud and courageous spirits um i'm complimented and honored to be uh, a part of this journey I just a few general thoughts um before i, I touch on just just a few aspects of what i've seen observed experienced uh, it's it's astonishing that we can have a collection of individuals such as this when, in essence, we are a xenophobic, misogynistic, genocidal, power-seeking species. And in our inventiveness, we've been able to invent sexism, genderism, racism, colonialism, and a word I don't hear frequently is speciesism as well. And yet we're also a species uh, who contains an immense benevolent spiritual force. Um, the same species that contains Mr. Putin contains Buffy St. Germain and Bella Abzug and Joseph Campbell and Nelson Mandela and, and our good Canadian McPhail and Michelle Obama. Uh, there's always a tension, a struggle, I think, between our internal biases, and I'd go so far as to say, in some instances, evil, um, and what is right, what is fair, what is equity, which I don't think most of us recognize um, as a robust construct. Um, in pursuit of fairness, I think that that absolutely grasps so much, whether I'm black, brown, uh, trans, and the list goes on. Um, I'm 64 years of age. Um, I run a private practice where I do a lot of trans medicine. I also do a lot of general psychiatric care. So my mandate is, is to relieve suffering, but involuntarily at a social level, uh, my journey has indicated that I had no choice really. Um, in order to, to realize myself, um, but become an advocate, both for those people who I serve, but also for those things that I think we, the more enlightened of us, can well believe in. Um, I've known since age four that my experience gender was, was female. So if you're in Flint Flon, Manitoba in grade four and you identify your favorite color as pink in a hockey playing town, you're in deep, doo-doo from the get-go and I don't, I don't think I've gotten out of the doo-doo ever since uh, my former partner um, and CBC enlightened this different concept to me called gee whiz uh, being transgender or as as times would have it transsexual uh, I don't regret my journey in the least and, and yet it's a journey that that lives I hope um, 
as an instrument of healing, hope, an example to people I see as following well within my mandate. And those are individuals with mental health issues. Those are individuals who are gender variant in, in any specific way. Um, so the obvious question on the table is, are there biases? Uh, are there judgments? And the obvious answer has to be for so many of us that that is the case. Um, I want to come back to a young Jamaican woman trying to buy a house and being declined politely. That, that is a beautiful story. Um, as a generalization, um, prejudice and still about two minds as to whether prejudice is a product of evil or ignorance or both. But to face that challenge of being less than, be it polite, this has been identified, or persecutory is, is both hurtful to the human spirit. And, and where am I going with this? I, I, there is a Canadian version, I believe, of, of bias and condemnation. Um, perhaps in America, they kick you out from the birthday party. In Canada, they just don't invite you to the birthday party. And in many respects, that's been the experience I've seen with, with so many of the individuals that I, that I serve and, and try and assist. Um, I fell into transgender medicine, recognizing that literature was saying uh, that for kids, adolescents, oftentimes that's the case, who recognize the transitioning. Some of you may be familiar with uh, jazz, the program. That's, that's a archetypal and I think a beautiful example of that. Um, but a study in Seattle said that when youngsters were coming out as being gender variant, 40% of them wound up on the street. That's pretty scary. Other parts of the literature says that for individuals who can't obtain access to gender care, culturally competent gender care, and technically competent gender care, the suicidality rate can be up to 12 times as high. So 10 years ago, there really was, was no place to go with the singular exception of the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, which had their challenges um, through the works of Rainbow Health Ontario, which is real advocacy at a political and a powerful level. Um, Rainbow Health Ontario were, were provincially funded, thank goodness, to move forward and represent the best health interests, social interests and cultural interests of the gender variant in the LGBT community. And they were incredibly successful in doing so. So I have to thank Rainbow Health Ontario. I, in, in some respects, I have to thank uh, former <laughs> provincial cabinet uh, for moving forward and saying, hey, there's needs here. And if the needs are not satisfied and addressed, then people are either jeopardized or falling into challenges with health problems or substance use issues or, or suicide. So how do we support our fellow male, female, and, and those who experience themselves or, or choose not to be um, in either of those places. The bottom line is, is variance. And I'll come back to my earlier commentary that we do tend, unfortunately, to be a species that's hardwired to be xenophobic. We distrust the other. We distrust the different. And that is a massive question in terms of how we best challenge that. In my own life, I, I for a number of reasons, I really felt that... Um, when I was 56, I had no chance but to, to fully transition. Uh, in 2006, when I was a deputy chief uh, of psychiatry in a different facility, I, I came forward and was promptly sent for a uh, mental health assessment and uh, disciplinary hearing. Um, that was instructive. I found a different position uh, establishing a mental health program in, in a different facility. Um, 2016, late 16, I, up to then I hadn't been, um, if you will, out at work. Um, I pursued that with some misgivings, um, but nonetheless did so in, in a spirit of, of advocacy. Uh, 
I don't wish to put this on the table as, as any dimension of self-pity. I put this on the table as an illustration of the journeys that I see, fortunately, far less often nowadays for many of the people that I see with, with gender issues. Uh, so I, I'm simply putting myself forward as an example um, of where things were, you know, not so terribly long ago. Uh, at point of transition, I was chief of a large psychiatry program. I was assistant professor uh, doing a fair amount of research. I was married um, to a long-term partner of 30 years. Um, I had a very close relationship with my daughter and a good relationship with my in-laws and family of origin. <laughs> Well, take, a break. take your time. Thank you. Take your time. That's why we're here. The good news, guys, is that I'm still here. I'm still practicing medicine. I'm still practicing psychiatry. And, and of all those things, I still have my two dogs. Um, and this story is, is not atypical um, for those of us of difference. We come back to your framing questions. How do we... How do we break the bias? Um, how do we shift things? How do we change things? And, and fortunately and unfortunately, I know of no inexpensive way to do so. Rights, freedoms, as we're learning again in today's world, um, autonomy, respect, um, none of these things come without a, a fight or a sacrifice, but at a spiritual level, I believe that rises from an immense wellspring of intrinsic intrinsic goodness that, thank goodness, does, does exist within the species. So the fight is a good one. Um, and as I recognized some, some time back when I was pondering the uh, alienation from my father, a good and decent man, loving man, um, Icelandic, which tells you immediately he's a hard ass, uh <laughs> raised on the prairies which tells you he's a conventionalist and i thought to myself e wait a minute you know and my father really had a struggle in, in understanding where i had gone and, and what i had done and then i came back to a thought we are raised within a culture we seek to honor and in some respects obey our heritage and our parentage but the wrinkle here is that do we, should we, as each succeeding generation endorse the untransformed values of our parentage, we should still be coping with slavery and many other worldly curses. So there is no way but for, I think, brave and good people to listen to their hearts. Uh, step forward, lead by example at a personal level, foster institutional progress and more than any of that um as you know as first nations as as any potentially segregated group stand up and refuse to go away so i'm very grateful for having a platform to bring forward some thoughts uh it is an ongoing fight i'm not sure when any of us will entirely dismiss xenophobia from our species but potentially we know there's an antidote so i want to thank yourself jill i want to thank collingwood uh a community i know well and, and respect immensely and and also thank the collegial spirit of people who are different people who suffer misogyny people who suffer racism and creatures who suffer even speciesism um maybe struggle for what is right and, and what is equity so I, I appreciate the time to speak. Thank you. Wow. Just have to take a moment. Everybody can take a breath. Um, I told you Dr. Marissa was super articulate. Um, that was, thank you for sharing your heart and your wisdom uh, and your lived experience and also that of the people who you serve. And um, I think it's a really uh, beautiful segue into, we're going to 
hit the Q and A shortly, but we have a short video that we want to uh, we want to show. And so, Dr. Marissa, I'm going to say, let's take a moment and watch the video, and then we're going to come back into the Q and A. And I know I've got questions, so I want all of you to be thinking about what are some of the questions you would love to have answered. And if there's somebody in particular that you uh, want to hear from, let us know. I may make the call to say, hey, let's hear from everybody on that one. And uh, we'll just play it as we go. Good afternoon. It is a pleasure to present this video on the town of Collingwood's evolution into international development programming to support women in local leadership with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, FCM. FCM represents a membership of more than 2,000 Canadian municipalities, more than 90% of the nation's population. FCM's national board and staff advocate with the federal government on federal policies that impact our municipalities, manage the federally funded Green Municipal Fund in excess of $1 billion to support communities' work on climate change adaptation and green infrastructure, and last but not least, develop and implement international programs funded by the federal government through Global Affairs Canada. The town has been active over many years with its sister cities' relationships Relationships internationally, Gitano, Japan, Boone, North Carolina, U.S., and Zihuatanejo, Mexico. More recently, the town has hosted two UN Habitat in towns, calling World Summits, bringing towns and small cities together globally to help identify challenges, opportunities, and innovation for urbanism. In October 2020, the FCM president appointed me as the governance rep of the Jordan Municipal Support Program, FCM's only international program in the Middle East. In our International Women's Day event last year, you heard from a JMSP staff member in Jordan, Hadil, and a Jordanian project participant. My work continues in that role, liaising with the Canadian volunteer partners, Canadian and Jordanian embassies, FCM staff in Jordan and Ottawa, and Global Affairs Canada. In a recent FCM announcement, excitingly, the town of Collingwood was successful in its council-supported application to join other Canadian partners as a volunteer community in the FCM PMI Will International Program, Partnerships for Municipal Innovation, Women in Local Leadership. This is a six-year project implemented in five countries, Benin, Cambodia, Ghana, Sri Lanka, and Zambia. PMI Will aims to achieve two core objectives, increasing women's capacity to get involved and lead in local governance and increasing local government's capacity to deliver inclusive, gender responsive services. Since November of 2021, I have been working virtually with partners in Ghana under the PMI Will program as a Canadian volunteer, facilitating completion of the self-assessment for 16 regions and shortly beginning the work on the capacity building assessment to inform the development of programs in which Collingwood staff and representatives will be participating. I join our council members, women and men, to say how extremely proud we are of our strong women of leadership in the town of Collingwood administration. We applaud their willingness to contribute to the project through an in-kind donation by the town, their expertise to our global community, and for embracing the opportunity for reciprocal learnings to benefit our town. Congratulations. Thank you. Lots going on. This is good. Lots of support, lots of initiatives. And um, as we head into our wrap up, I wanted to thank our speakers today for sharing your stories, for being real, for allowing emotion, for um, honoring each other, and also for um, starting to prompt some ideas for us around where we may have come in today's session, not necessarily knowing where we wanna have an impact or not necessarily knowing how. I know I got more clarity on some things. And, and one of them I think is the theme of showing up. Um, to your point, Makpalu, you know, show up at things. <laughs> you know, be go to have an experience of a cultural event or, um, show up for people, as to your point, Marcia, who um, maybe are saying things that are inappropriate and or they're not aware of the impact even that they're having, or maybe they are aware. Um, so showing up for yourself and other people around you. And to your point, Dr. Marissa, your story of, you know, students standing up for each other, I felt like there was this, this theme of show up. And that can happen in lots of ways. That's being present. That's paying for services. That's how we hire. That's how we see the, the world. Um, there's all kinds of ways. So here's what I want to do. Um, there's some great stuff going into the chat. So I don't I want to acknowledge it before I give this shout out for what's going to happen next. Um, Amanda's posting stuff around community initiatives. Uh, I'm assuming a lot of this will be in the follow up email. So if you're not copying and pasting, don't sweat it. I think the town's got you covered. Um, I also want to acknowledge the charities that everybody has supported are here and will be also in the, uh, the follow up email. And uh, Dr. Marissa has the SPCA for Ontario. Uh, so um, you'll see all of those. 
Um, so thank you for all of these, Fran, everybody. I'm not going to have time to acknowledge them all, but thank you for putting them in. We'll keep keep typing. Um, as we wrap up, I wanted to say uh, a couple things. One is thank you to the committee who made this all possible. To everybody, Tyler, who made the magic happen of technology, to the mayor, Saunderson, and the town of Collingwood. And then all of our sponsors, you know, people like Baker Tilly, Collingwood Foundry, Devon Lee Homes, Eager Beaver Services, Miller Thompson, RBC, Collingwood Branch, RBC Dominion Securities, Royal Canadian Legion, Branch 63, our anonymous donor, you know who you are, and uh, the Collingwood Museum, who also posted some pieces in here that I'm sure will be in the follow up, and Collingwood Downtown. So thank you to my friend's house for your video. Thank you, Allison and Lisa, and for reminding us of the importance of the role that my friend's house plays. And all of the charities are list will be listed in the email and are listed here. So please know that um, if you're called, we'd love for you to donate. And that's one way that you can take action. With that, uh, we are going to wrap up. And um, I wanted to say an overall thank you for uh, the honor of hosting again or moderating this year. And um, every year there's a different kind of theme. And I feel like this year um, we really went deep quickly and had some real conversations and not that in other years we haven't, but I felt like we had more of a forum and a little more time this year. So thank you to our three speakers for bringing that energy of having real conversation. We need more of that and then real action. So I look forward to seeing you out there in the community and um, actioning this stuff. The Unity Collective is obviously doing some of that. So we'll see also maybe what pops through that group that we can be paying attention to. Um, we've got Pride Collingwood and lots of people and organizations doing great things out there. Shelby's got her hands up. So with that, I'm going to close off unless there's anything from any of the committee members you need to say, I'm going to wish everybody a great day ahead and hope you take the energy from here with you. And if you want to put a shout out, thank you to any of the speakers or anything, please throw that in the chat. We really appreciate it. Um, and I will leave it at that. Thank you all for celebrating with us. It's an honor to be able to address everyone who's watching this video to tell you about My Friend's House and to thank you for your donations and your support. My Friend's House name is near and dear to our hearts. It used to be when we first opened, our, our name used to be just Collingwood Crisis Centre. It was uninspiring and really didn't describe what we did. Shortly after we opened, we had a boy staying with, at my friend's house with his mother. We were, he was told to go back to school, be with his friends, to have a nice break from the disruption in his life. And when he went to school, he told his friends that he had moved. And when the kids asked him where he had moved, he had said, my friend's house. And in that moment, we realized who we were and why we exist. That is to be a friend to 
abuse women and their children in this community. I can't thank our community enough for providing the support we need to keep our doors open 24-7. Without you, there's no way, there is no way our doors would be open. You are the ones that keep moving us forward. I so appreciate you. Thanks for being a friend.